It's been almost two hours, and you've been sitting down. Why don't you stand up? You need to stretch. This is too much. I've been sitting, and I'm going, come on, get up. And while we're doing that, I wanted to thank uh, Don and Michael and Lanier and Guy and Randall that are co that's coming up and, and others and all of these great things for sharing their idea and actually inspiring us. And th this is what it's all about. So keep stretching. And by the way, I'm looking at this. I wanted to know if it was a real phone, but it's a fake I want to call them out. There's no, there are buttons here. We know that's not the way it goes. So you can stand up or sit down whenever you want. I'm going to start talking. And uh, what I wanted to do first is really tell you what the heck I do. And I have one of the best jobs uh, in, in the world in the sense that for 21 years I've worked for a high-tech company that in many, many ways is at the forefront and at the beginning of making all the changes that we're witnessing in our world today and representing not only this company and representing probably one of the best known CEOs uh, in our industry, John Chambers, it's really given me an opportunity to see the world through a very different lens and a very different dimension. And after seeing all of that, I come from a place where I firmly believe that we are living in one of the greatest times in history. I'm an optimist and you should know that right up front but it is a great time to be alive. You know, and I think sometimes we're so involved and we're so engaged in what we do on a daily basis that we forget how truly magical this period in time is for the world. If you go back and you reflect over the transformation and the challenges and the changes that we have seen in humanity over the last 25 years, it's amazing, right? Just stop for a moment and think in the last 25 years, we've seen the birth of the web and the internet, We've seen social media be born and be connected, and we've seen mobile phones come into our lives. This is only a quarter of a century ago. We didn't have any of this, and now it's worked our way and permeated in every sense of our, of our world where now there's something called TTS, time to screen, from the moment one wakes up to the moment you're touching a cell phone is under five minutes. Right? I have a wife who's not a technologist and she's checking the weather before she's even awake. Right? It's permeated. There's a disease now called nomophobia, which is the fear of being without your telephone, your cell phone. <laughs> How many of you suffered? There's 62% of us, so I'm sure there's a whole bunch of you there. But that's where we're coming from in this transformation that we are seeing is really absolutely incredible. At the heart of this change, is the notion of connectivity. We're connected in ways that we were never connected before. I had the privilege of uh, visiting uh, ancient Rome over the summer with my family, and it was amazing to go, oh, here's where they make the laws, here's where people live, here's where they cook and eat. And it was all very, very, you know, together from a distance perspective. And what you come to a realization is most of mankind, people have been born, they live and they die within a 30-mile radius. And thanks to connectivity and thanks to technology distance is dead the barriers of living within this 30 mile radius have totally been decimated so people are connected now in ways that we could never dream before and i get to witness it on a daily basis knowledge has been democratized you saw clay shirky talking about the printing press and all these things knowledge is everywhere it's accessible it's no longer a control point for any of us we have access to it where it's available and it changes our lives. You know, we're starting to see us, all of us, moving from consumers. We used to have to buy a product the way it was delivered. We need to read the paper the way it was given to us. And we've moved from consumers now where we're not only consuming, we're contributing. We're contributing to product designs. We're contributing to news. We're contributing to blogs. We have power. And, you know, on a daily basis, mankind, collectively, all of us, generate up to 70 times the amount of information that's available in the Library of Congress. We're contributing a lot, you know, and it's something really, really powerful. There's a good friend of mine uh, by the name of Rick Smolin who just finished writing a book called The Human Face of Big Data. And he has a couple of facts in here that totally blew my mind. Fact one was that 30% of prenatal kids before they are born have a digital presence on the net before their birth. One third. And that's in the form of a sonogram that their parents take and say, hey, little Carlos is here, look at him. Ooh, his, you know, and they do that. 
What happens is by the age of two, that grows to 92%, right? And if you think of the amount of data that is generated with video and photos and blogs and things that we're sharing on the birth of a child on a daily basis, it is mind-blowing. We're exposed to more information and more data and more knowledge on a daily basis than people would experience an entire lifetime in the 17 and 1800s. And we do that in a single day. So as we look forward and we look at the future, what's that going to be like? Is it positive? Is it negative? I think the best is yet to come. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about how connectivity and understanding and decoding what connectivity is, how is that going to change us and what benefits it's going to bring to us in living and being part of this totally connected, hyper-connected world in which we're living. So to add a little bit of, of kind of structure for understanding, sometimes it's good to look at the past so we can look towards the future. So I have these five ways of connectivity. On one axis, the more connections you have, the faster these connections are, the more intelligent these connections are, the more value they have. And on the other axis, as business and societal impact increases as we move up. And all of this is really creating mass disruption. So we've had these five waves, and let's kind of walk them through in a little bit more detail in this fast uh, movement here. So wave one really started with the birth of the commercial internet. And that was in the 1990 time frame. We had three million users in 1990, right? Very, very beginning of the internet. And that was really an infrastructure play. Look at the companies that were the predecessors to 1990. You know, you had the Intels, the Microsoft, all of these companies that really needed to be connected. And actually, my company, Cisco, was born in that predecessor to connect and make these things available. The second wave, which is really interesting, and it grew in 1997 to 76 million users, was really all about businesses connecting. Right Before then, businesses didn't even have a presence. It's kind of funny, in 1997, I would talk to many of the CIOs and CEOs in the financial industry in New York and say, hey, you need to have a digital presence. Imagine today opening a business. The argument is quite different is, do you need a physical presence, right, depending on what you're delivering? And we've seen all of these companies like eBay, Google uh, be born of that era. The third wave, which is uh, a very interesting one, is really in the 2004 area. And it was really about connectivity of people. This is where really all the transformation started happening. Social took over, right? We have all of these people uh, connecting. Mobility began to really be real because we had the advent of the smartphone uh, coming to be. And we started collaborating in ways that we could never imagine. And this is where mankind, for the first time, we all were connected in a way that was never possible before. This is where true disruption really started taking place. We started seeing people have power. We've all seen it with the Arab Spring in, in, in Egypt and all the things that are happening there. It's people having power, and the reason they have power is we're connected. I was, I was not happy with the government. I find out through connections that you're not happy with the government. We both figure out that we want to do something about it, and so do about a million other people, and we show up in a square and we complain. Right? And that leads to disruption and all the changes. We have a voice for the first time in a collective sort of way. Then the fourth wave, which is started in 2010, now we're up to 2.4 billion connections, not all humans anymore. Now we're starting to connect things, right? Sensors are starting to be deployed. There's some machine-to-machine -machine communications going on, and a whole bunch of things are taking place. And what you start doing is, why is all of this disruption and these connections of devices happening now? Well, actually, there's a perfect storm going on. And when you look at this perfect storm, it actually compromises a few things. I think we're all extremely familiar with Metcalfe's uh, law and uh, Moore's law, right? Moore's law, which has to do around computing doubling. Look at, look at how computing is doubling. The example that really brings Moore's law to life is that if you take the computing power in 1969, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, we take all the computing power of the lunar module, we take the computing power of Johnson Space Center in Houston, the, all of that to get a man on the moon was equivalent to what a Game Boy did in the year 2000. <laughs> That's a really good example of how exponential these growths have been. The second thing that, that uh, really creates this perfect storm is the affordability. You know, believe it or not, in 1980, a cost of a gigabyte was a million dollars. 
And I can venture to say that many of you probably have a USB or you have a phone in your pocket with 32 gigs. Imagine if we did the, you know, that, that would be $32 million right here, right? <laughs> Look at how things have changed. And all of this is really creating this prediction that a lot of devices and things are going to connect in the trillions, right? And all of these devices are going to be creating data. So we're moving to an era where there's a whole new series of internet inhabitants, right? They're simple, they're smart, they're accessed via the cloud, right? They're device agnostic, and all of them are generating data. And, and I never would have imagined the day where a thermostat or a light bulb or a Nike Fuel or any of these things would be connected. So let's explore just a couple of them. How many of you are familiar with the Nest thermostat? A few of you? How many of you have one? A few of you. Okay, I knew you would, guy. I'm not surprised by that. But, you know, this, this, this thermostat is so cool in the sense that it's internet connected. And the simplicity of it is they tell you when you're hot, make it cold. When you're cold, make it hot. And just by doing that very simple action, right, it runs a whole series of algorithms and says that it will save you between 20 and 30 percent on your energy bill, right? And it generates all these reports. I can go on my phone or my tablet and I can go and change any of the settings, right? I'm in away mode. I can control any one of the thermostats in my home and it starts applying all sorts of technology. Intelligence in a thermostat. So it gets even, you know, kind of more interesting. Who could have ever imagined, I know Edison couldn't have figured, that the light bulb was going to be connected to the internet. How many of you have seen or have uh, Philip Shue at home? I know, guy, raise your hand, come on. <laughs> you know, you know, here it is, a light bulb is connected. It's LED, doesn't consume much power, right? You put this little device, you can control it. It changes, I don't know how many millions of colors. You can create scenes, turn things on and off. You can control a light bulb. Now, I've given you two examples of homes, right? Where is this coming when you look at it in a different sort of application? So if you look at it in a more of a connected city sort of environment, right, there's this notion of smart street lamps that are coming out. These street lamps are extremely sophisticated. They have sensors on it that detect water, bioterrorism. They've got speakers on the top. They've got con connectivity on it. They've got digital signage to be able to post all sorts of things on it. But this is going to be smart. We're going to be walking down the street, and as we hit one of these light posts, it's going to go on, right? It's going to illuminate our path as we need it. It's going to shut off when there's no one there, right? They're going to be intelligent. They're going to be smart. So this leads to where are we going, right? From now and into the future, there's going to be trillions of devices that are going to be connected. They're going to converge. And that's where the power lies. Most of innovation that happens, happens in silos, in stage one. Stage two is when they kind of converge and the value really comes in. And this is where we're starting to call it. We, we, were, we were talking about the Internet of Things, where things are connected. Now we're starting to think about the Internet of Everything, where we're combining a few things. So let me just take a moment to explain some of the challenges as we think about connecting trillions of devices. First of all, the growth of these devices is exponential. Right, we're going from a couple of billion to trillions. That's a lot of growth in a very short period of time. The second thing is, how do you secure them? How do we make sure that we don't put some sensors out there that people can hack into and really mess everything up? From traffic lights to automated cars to all sorts of things, right? Pacemakers. Will you imagine somebody hacking into your pacemaker? That's not a good thing, right? And, and most of these things are single-purpose analytics, and, and they're very complex. I mean, they really are as you look at these things. So as we think about trillions of devices connecting, the way we're looking at the world is really we need to connect not only people, we need to connect things, we need to understand the data that they're producing and do it in a process that's controllable, or maybe saying it a little bit different, it's a systematic approach that adds intelligence, convergence, visibility, security, and ultimately gives you value, which is what it's all about. So let me give you a kind of a, a, a little bit of a, of a view on data. How, how many of you know about big data? I mean, everyone, right? Hadoop and everybody, everyone talks about big data. The traditional trajectory for big data is as this chart so, shows. The more data you have over time, the more valuable it becomes. And that has been the rule for big data for a very long time. I submit to you that there's actually a new class of data being born. And the new class of data is something we're calling data in motion. It's data that's real time. For example, a sensor in a car detecting that you're going to collide and applying a brake, that's data in motion. 
right? It's, it's real time, it's sensitive. And what is very interesting about data in motion, it's actually taking a different value curve on, on value. It actually is less valuable over time. So we're looking at two very, very different data sets. And this is real time, it's being processed locally and through a lot of analysis. And we start questioning whether we need to store it at all, right? And all of these things are really playing a very significant role. And what's happening now is really a combination of taking data in motion and historical data and bridging them together and running predictive analytics to be able to change the outcomes of people. And this is where the power lies. This is where the opportunity for the future is. And this is what I'm really, really excited about. So there's an opportunity to look at this to, to turn data into wisdom. And the best example I can give you is I recently went in and I got some blood tests from my doctor. My doctor said to me, okay, we got to talk. So when they did the blood test, what came back to me was just numbers. It didn't mean anything. It was just pure data. When I sat down with my doctor, Right? He started talking to me about it. And he said, hey, Carlos, you know, you got to lose a little weight. You know, black makes you look thin. I need to lose a little weight. You know, I have high cholesterol, right? And my blood pressure is borderline. So now that data has turned to information for me. Then they took that and he sat with me and he said, hey, let me give you some words of wisdom. You got to eat right. You got to exercise. I'm going to put you on medication. So now I've got knowledge. But the real missing piece of this triangle is the moment I am going to make a decision, how do I have the insight to make the right decision? So this notion of, you know, can you use your device, your mobile phone, with time to screen of less than five minutes from the moment you wake up, and we have it with us all the time, to really change outcomes and bring data to us in a way that was never possible. So what I did was is, you know, if you think about it, location-based services we have on our phone. So in this example, I'm on the corner of Warren and Greenwich, which is not that important. What's more important is that I'm actually outside of a Whole Foods and I'm getting ready to shop. So when I'm outside of a Whole Foods, I want some preferences to be kicked in automatically on my phone. So the preferences that I'm asking my phone to do is the following. The first thing I want it to do is to load a health uh, assistant application. This pulls up all of my information and, and, and the data uh, that uh, is pertinent to my specific record. I also wanted to go out and securely access my health record in a, in a secure and encrypted way. And now you see the cholesterol there and everything else. It's accessing my Nike fuel band that I have here and I wear, and it's measuring my activity. As you can see, I haven't hit my exercise uh, for the day. And the last thing it does, it launches an augmented reality application. So now I am armed, and I'm ready to go, and I'm ready to go shopping. So as I enter Whole Foods and I'm going there, I'm going through the aisles, and I'm using my camera with augmented reality to check, and it checks and it says apples, and my application comes back and looks at it and goes, okay, Carlos, happy face, that's good. You want to add it to your cart, no cholesterol, you know, click here for nutritional information. So that's really good, it makes me happy. So then what happens is I keep walking around and now I'm by the long beer, right? Get some brews, right? And as I do there, I get the unhappy face. And it's coming back and saying, sorry, Carlos, it interferes with your medications, right? And I know you hate me, right? So this simple, jovial example that I just shared with you really changes outcomes. It gives me the data that I need at the moment that I am making the decisions to get the desired outcome. And that's really what it's all about. And the opportunity for this to happen is amazing. Right? It's kind of funny, uh, Professor uh, Nelson said this about trying to determine market size. He says, trying to determine the market size for the Internet of Things is like trying to calculate the market for plastics circa 1940. Right? At this time, it was difficult to imagine that plastics could be everywhere. And that's really the challenge. But we think there's a lot at stake. I think all of these sensors connected, doing predictive analytics, interfacing to us, helping us do more wisdom will drive a lot of value and productivity into the world and into our businesses. And it's going to happen through tremendous economic transformation in a variety of different ways. And again, the Internet and then the Internet of Things have all played a really significant role in impacting our economic capability. So the future world of sensors, as there are trillions of smart objects out there, they're going to be really having an impact on everything. We're going to see it in smart grid and changing how energy is delivered and produced. We're going to see it in connected commercial ground vehicles on um, being more efficient, picking the right routes, you know, making sure that the deliveries are done in a much uh, more effective sort of way. We're starting to see it in smart buildings, which sensors are detecting 
you know, when people are there, when they're not, it controls air conditioning, it controls lighting, it controls everything. We're seeing it in smart factories for devices to produce in a very, very controlled sort of way. And even in many ways, machines repairing themselves and notifying that they need to be repaired, right? All of these things are creating a new world. And my final thought in bringing you back to where I started, telling you that this is a great time to be alive. And I firmly believe that in my heart and in my soul. And I'll conclude with one example. This young man that's here is Jack and Draca. I got the opportunity to go to Clinton Global Initiative, and I got to meet with world leaders and President Clinton and everybody else. And out of everyone that I met, when I left there and I was most inspired was by this young 15-year-old. And this 15-year-old was able to create and invent a cancer test 100 times more sensitive and 28 times cheaper than current tests. And his inspiration was a loved one in his family died from pancreatic cancer. And that death inspired him to try to find the cure. And just by using the internet, just by using the knowledge that is available to us, he was able to produce this. And that's why I tell you it's an incredible time to be alive. Thank you very much for your time.